There are many questions that we all come across in life as we journey. We've asked three of those so far. Uh, what do you do when you hit rock bottom? What can I learn from those rock bottom experiences? Why does God let me struggle? If you missed any of those messages, you can catch them on the church website. Today we're going to ask a different kind of question. I think it's one that a lot of people really struggle with today in this age of discontent in which we seem to live. The question is, how do we find contentment in life? Contentment is a huge issue for Canadians today. We've got one of the highest standards of living in the world, and yet sometimes all we seem to do is to complain about everything. We complain about the weather, the political system, the cost of gas and food, the time of day our neighbour cuts their grass, Sorry, that's my concern. <laughs> the length of my sermons. Well, you get the idea. The truth is, I think that we are much more discontented than any previous generation. Previous generations who had so much less than we do. Now, maybe it's not all that surprising. Because we live in the age of spin doctors and media barons and slick advertisers who tell us all the time, if you buy this product, you will be eternally happy until the newer, better version comes out in six months' time. The byline of our society is that you're only one trinket, one product, one lottery win away from contentment. Think about it. Aren't those the kind of ideas that fuel our materialistic society? I mean, after all, you could even take your child or your grandchild to McDonald's and buy them a happy meal. Trust me, I've been there, done that, and from my experience, happy meals don't bring contentment if the child doesn't get the toy that they wanted. <laughs> you get it, don't you? A happy meal can't buy happiness or contentment. But how about a new car, a bigger house, a multi-million lottery win? Will that do it? In fact, can you put a price on contentment? In his book, Authentic Success, Dr. Robert Holden says this, beware of destination addiction, a preoccupation with the idea that happiness is in the next place, the next job, and with the next partner. Until you give up the idea that happiness is somewhere else, it will never be where you are. Let me say that again because I think it's so important. Beware of destination addiction, a preoccupation with the idea that happiness is in the next place the next job, and with the next partner. Until you give up the idea that happiness is somewhere else, it will never be where you are. That's actually quite biblical. Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote in the New Testament about contentment. 
Philippians 4, verses 11 to 13. We've read it earlier. I want to read it again from the Living Bible translation. Paul says, I have learned how to get along happily, whether I have much or little. I know how to live in almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of contentment in every situation, whether it be a full stomach or hunger, plenty or want, for I can do everything God asks me to do with the help of Christ who gives me strength and power. Paul says, I have learned how to be content. Contentment, you see, doesn't just happen. We're not born with it. We don't learn it at university or college. It doesn't come wrapped as a gift under the Christmas tree. It's a learned skill. So how do we learn to be content? We learn it as we practice it. And the more we practice it, the more it becomes part of who we are. It's an inside transformation. It's an issue of the soul. It's a work of God. The eccentric billionaire Howard Hughes, he never learned the secret of contentment. When once asked by a reporter, Mr. Hughes, how much money is enough? Hughes smiled and said, just a little bit more. That's our problem in a nutshell, isn't it? Contentment escapes us because the more we have, the more we want. And the more we want, the more we'll do to get it. Even if that means we have to neglect our marriage or our family, even if it means we have to trample on others in order to get the top of the corporate ladder, even if it means we don't pay our employees a living wage. But that's not contentment. Scripture says that contentment is not about how much or even about how little you have. It's about your attitude towards what you have. Again, as Paul said, I have learned how to get along happily whether I have much or little. My wife and I are doing what people I gather of our ages do. We're decluttering. Or we're downsizing. Or we're just frustrating ourselves. I'm not sure what the right answer is. But you know, I look around our house and I see how much stuff we have. And then our kids say, we don't want any of it. Give it all away. If it's still here when you die, we'll just bring in a dumpster and throw everything in there. My wife's turning white. But you know, I look around and I think, how much of this stuff do we have that contributes to our contentment? And the answer, honestly, is not very much. Discontentment is, in fact, a modern form of slavery, when you think about it. But learning to be content sets us free. I mean, that's what Scripture promises, right? That the truth will set you free. And contentment 
is freedom from always being satisfied from always being dissatisfied with what you have or you don't have. It's freedom from saying, I just have to have that. I can't live without that. It's freedom from keeping up with the Joneses and maxing out your credit cards to, to buy more stuff you don't need to impress people you don't like. Or look at contentment from another angle. If you don't think you'll be content until your life is perfect, however you define perfect, you're simply setting yourself up for a big disappointment because there's lots of imperfection in this world. There are lots of disappointments. There are lots of mountaintops, but there are lots of deep valleys as well. There are lots of curves on the road and dead ends. The root of the problem is that because of sin, we're all imperfect. We live in an imperfect world with imperfect people. We're married to imperfect spouses. And right now I'm praying that my spouse is not watching this live stream. <laughs> We've got imperfect children, grandchildren, parents, bosses, co-workers, neighbors, and friends. We've got imperfect jobs, churches, schools, health care, and political systems. So if you're looking for people or for things to make you content, you're looking at the impossible, this side of heaven. And that's why scripture is so clear, that contentment doesn't come from things. It only comes from a relationship with God, our creator, who speaks to us through scripture and ultimately through Jesus, our savior. So here's where the rubber hits the road. How do we learn to be content? First, examine your attitude. Remember Paul said that he had to learn to be content. I love what Abraham Lincoln once said. We can complain because rose bushes have thorns or rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. It's a matter of attitude. A positive attitude introduces an element of hope into every situation and hope fosters contentment. But a negative attitude makes every situation seem more desperate and that fosters discontent. Unfortunately, our society at this present moment seems to have been overcome with negativity. And with that being the primary emotion in our society, is it any wonder that there's so much discontent? That's why we need God's help. Listen to Paul again in Philippians chapter 4. I have learned the secret of contentment. I can do everything God asks me with the help of Christ who gives me power. In his mighty power, Christ can do the seemingly impossible. Everything and everyone he touches, he changes. And when we invite him to help us, he can change our attitude from one of negativity to one of 
disappointment to one of contentment as we learn to trust him more and more every day. So the first secret of contentment is to examine your attitude and make some changes there. The second secret of contentment is to cultivate a grateful heart. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, when I read that kind of thing, my first thought is, well, Paul, it's easy to talk about giving thanks when things are going well in your life, and I do that. But if some of the things that had happened in my life had happened to you, you wouldn't want to give thanks. But giving thanks in all circumstances actually makes sense because it helps us to create within ourselves an attitude of gratitude. I think that's what hymn writer Johnson Oatman Jr. was trying to teach us when he wrote, when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many, name them, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. The third secret of contentment is to put a priority on the things of your soul. Why? Because our lives have eternal value and we are precious to God. But the materialism of our age often makes us forget that profound truth. It makes us think that our value is in what we have, not in who we are as children of God. So listen to Jesus in Matthew's Gospel. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What Jesus is really saying to us is that when you have a God-focused life, you will have the trust and the faith that are at the root of being content. That's why Paul was able to affirm in Philippians 4 verse 11 that I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Now you might be thinking, easy for Paul to say. He isn't in the marriage I'm in. He doesn't have the chronic pain I deal with every day. He doesn't have my fam family problems. He doesn't know my circumstances or my struggles. But if you know anything at all about Paul's life, you'll know that his life wasn't easy either. This is how he described it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 
the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open ocean. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, that's from the non-Jewish population, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. So how could he possibly stay content given those circumstances? Well, he made this his life priority, will you? Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 to 11. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Contentment is the byproduct of living a life according to God's will. Only then does contentment become something we can embrace and not something that always seems so elusive. Thanks be to God.